don't want to waste too much time as a pastor asks me and Minister Dorian to give a word for the new year. Um, there is a story in the Bible that I love so much. We are still continuing our message on message in the miracle. It's a wonderful series. If you have not checked it out, please check it out. It's been such a blessing to know the message within the miracle. Amen. You can clap for that. Amazing, amazing message. Amazing series. Buy the tape and the CD um, and watch it online. And so uh, one of my favorite stories is in Daniel chapter 3. So if you will, stand up for the reading of his word. I'm a little old school. I like when that happens. Somebody said amen. They know what I'm talking about. Get your Bibles open to Daniel chapter 3. I'm going to read excerpts. I'm going to read from Daniel chapter 3, verses 28 and 29. Then I'm going to skip, oh, excuse me, verses 15 through 18. Then I'm going to go to 24 and 25. And then I'm going to go to 28 and 29. When you have it, say amen. Online, if you have it, say amen as well. Just type that on the chat. Amen. Daniel chapter 3, verses 15 through 18. It says, I will give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue I have made when you hear the sound of the musical instruments. But if you refuse, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. And then what God will be able to rescue you from my power? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. Excuse me one moment. My iPhone, praise the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Okay, where's my place? Yes, there we go. We do not need to defend ourselves before you. If, you, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. Skipping to verses 24. But suddenly, Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in amazement and exclaimed to his advisors, didn't we tie up three men and throw them into the furnace? Yes, your majesty, we certainly did, they replied. Look, Nebuchadnezzar shouted, I see four men are unbound, walking around in the fire unharmed. And the fourth looks like God. Skip to verse 28. Then King Nebuchadnezzar said, praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angel to rescue his servants who trusted in him. They defied the king's command and were willing to die rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make this decree. If any people, whatever their race or nation or language, speak a word against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they will be torn limb from limb, and their houses will be turned into heaps of rubble. There is no other god who corrects you like this. Let us pray. Oh, Father, we thank you right now because you are a God that not only does miracles, but you are a God that brings us together in those miracles. Father, we ask you, Lord, as you speak through me and Minister Dorian, Father, that all distractions be silenced in our minds and that we hear what your Holy Spirit has to say. We thank you. And while we talk to you, thank you, Lord, for giving Orlando Magic two wins in a row, Father. We're number one in the East atop, Lord, and let that favor go throughout the whole season, Lord, Father. In Christ's name and the church say, amen. While you're talking to God, you better ask him for favor. <laughs> well, welcome and Merry Christmas to everyone. We would like to say welcome, welcome, welcome. The last Sunday of 2020, it's been a very surprising up and down year, and if you're like me, and if you're listening to the sound of my voice, that means that God has graced you and protects you and given you favor. Let's give him praise for that. And if you're like me as well, you know very well, if he did that, that means he has a purpose for your life. The series we've been going through is called Message in the Miracle, and really quickly, as I look at this passage, I really want to state just a miracle is simply this. A miracle is the divine intervention where God exercises his supernatural authority over natural affairs. 
Again, a miracle is just a divine intervention where God exercises his supernatural authority over the natural affairs of mankind. And we see it all the time. We see in the scripture where God shows his authority over water. He walks on water. God shows his authority and commands the winds. God shows his authority in people's lives. And if you're like me, when God does a miracle and you see miracles like this happen, a question comes to your mind like, God, can you please just do that all the time? That's all the time. Why don't you just do it all the time? I know the answer, you know, a perverse generation acts for signs, but Lord, I'll worship you anyway, but just do it all the time. And of course, our favorite miracles are the financial ones, like, Father, do it again, Lord. Please just do it again. But God shows his authority over the natural things of man. And I like to say in layman terms, a miracle is just simply this, when God shows up and he shows out. And if you are from where I'm from and grew up where I grew up, if you ever heard somebody say, I'm about to show up and show out, that means it's about to go down. That means the person who said it is going to show without a doubt their superiority and that they have the most ability in whatever it is that you are testing them in. And so we see here that God showed up and showed out in such a way that there was no doubt that this was the Lord that did the amazing miracle. And in Daniel 24 and 25, God showed that in an example. And basically the miracle is this. God protected these three young men, three worshipers, from being burnt in the fire. But when you show up and show out, you got to do it in an extra special way. He not only protected them from the fire, but the Bible says that he also came in the fire with the three men. And so we could preach that all day. And we could have sermons that says you need to have faith that's fireproof. You know, when it gets hot in the kitchen, God is even hotter. But what's amazing about this is that he not only did a miracle, but also too, he allowed people that didn't have faith to see him as though they did have faith. And in theological terms, There's a real quick term, it might be on the board, that it says when God shows up and shows out, it's it's called a theophany. And a theophany is quickly this, a visible appearance of a manifestation of God to mankind in the Bible, normally in the Old Testament. Or they call it a Christophany. A Christophany is a visible appearance of, of a manifestation of Christ to mankind. And a lot of people, theologians believe that this was God the Father coming in the flesh as a man in the fire. Some people believe that it's, it's actually a, a type of Christ that was in the fire. Other, other people believe that it's an angel that was the fourth man in the fire. But whatever it was, that person represented God in the fire with these three young men. But if you're like me, when you read a story like this, we automatically make ourselves the protagonist. We become the hero in the story. So I'm reading this like, yes, Lord, I'm Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and I have faith in you. And 2020 been burning me up, but you saved me from the fires of 2020. You saved me and everything like that. That's what's going on in my mind. But the Holy Spirit has a funny way of showing you who you are in Scripture. And the Holy Spirit says, Jonas, sometimes you are like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But to tell you the truth, more often than not, you are the Nebuchadnezzar in the story. You are the antagonist in the story because the human heart is more likened to the heart of Nebuchadnezzar than the heart of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And the greatest miracle that God has ever done is not miracles where he shows his authority over the natural things of mankind, but when God shows his authority over the hearts of wicked, prideful people. And so I started to see, what are you talking about, Holy Spirit? It's like, this is the miracle that you should be shouting about. And it gave me a thought. He said, you know, to us, when God shows his authority in our lives, it's a miracle. But you ever think to yourself, what is a miracle to the angels? What's a miracle to the demons? Because they look at God having authority over the things we don't have authority. And they said, that's just God being God. Of course, Jesus could walk on water. Of course, he could command the winds. But how do you change a sinful heart? The Bible says the only time the angels praise 
and sees what's going on and praises the Lord is when someone that was a sinner comes into the faith in Jesus Christ. We know you have authority, but when you're changing the hearts of man, now you're just showing up and showing out. And for some of us, for the year 2020, out of all the miracles God could do, if God could change cancer and make it make go away, that's amazing. But if you could save my loved ones, if you could save my family members, we are praying for people that have that Nebuchadnezzar heart. If you could do that, Lord, you're just showing up and showing out. So God was ministering to me, and I hope he's ministering to you right now. He says, look at Nebuchadnezzar. Look how your heart matches his. Don't go bad and talk bad about Nebuchadnezzar because if you, if you were given what Nebuchadnezzar was given, if you were given all the power, all the authority, you'll probably make a golden statue of yourself as well. You may not have a golden statue, but you do have a career. You may not have a golden statue, but you do have family. You may not have a golden statue, but you do have your ego. Whatever that you put in front of God and worship it instead of God, that's your golden statue. And anytime anyone does not recognize the thing you worship, you get offended. And so we are just like Nebuchadnezzar. And, 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 and I'm not a prophet, but I'm telling you right now that when calamity happens and a pandemic happens, what happens is people start to look for God and start to look for answers. And my prayer for 2020 is for the church to get ready and open their doors to the Nebuchadnezzars that's going to be searching for the Lord. What I see what's going on right now is the miracle that God would allow in your life is really not for you. Because as we can see, the true miracle is in, in, in the end of the verse. Because in one moment, Nebuchadnezzar is cursing anyone who doesn't worship his golden statue. But in verse 28 and 29, he says, there's no other God but the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So your miracle is not just for you. Your miracle is for other people that see you and say, I want to know a God like that. Because if he could do it in your life, he could do it in mine. And I'll say one more thing for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. What's amazing about these young men, because you see the two kinds of heart. You have a Nebuchadnezzar heart, a heart that does not have faith, that needs a sign in order to believe in God. And then you have Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, who has faith and doesn't need a sign to believe in God. What's so powerful about these three young men is these three young men did not have any sign. They did not have any miracle. All they were going off is the testimonies of their grandparents, their great-grandparents, all they were going off is the word of God. And what's amazing is preachers nowadays, we have to go through hoops. We have to entertain because this is a generation that don't get off, thus says the Lord. And these young men, so young, says we don't even have to believe that God can do it. Just because we believe in his word, we know he could do it. That's the kind of faith we need. But what's amazing is when God changes your heart. And I'm telling you, for 2021, get ready, church. There's going to be a lot of theophany moments where God is going to show up and show out. And he's going to show up and show out in your life in such a way that people that was making fun of you are actually going to be the one testifying. People that were looking at you like, why are you going to church? Why are you praising? Why are you worshiping God? When they see what you're going through, they think that you're going to be doomed and that nothing can save you. But then, but God, they're going to be the ones testifying. They're going to be the ones asking you questions. They're going to be the ones like Nicodemus calling you in the middle of the night. But my answer to you is do not reject the heart of Nicodemus because you used to be one too. Amen. If you receive that word, let's worship the Lord. Let's worship the Lord. Now I have the privilege of introducing just a dynamic speaker, a dynamic communicator. I, 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 he has the voice of God. When he speaks, it's like a mixture of Billy Graham and Billy D. Williams. I don't know which one. Just so smooth, but really just a humble, humble, humble man. And uh, when you find somebody that's so talented and so humble, that is very, very rare. And we are so happy to have him. Can you please lift your hands and worship the Lord for Minister Dorian. Praise the Lord. Can we go 
go ahead and give God praise one more time. Amen, amen. If you could, please, can you just give me a little bit more monitor up here? I can barely hear myself, and I don't want to yell. Pastor David, thank you so much for yet another opportunity just to share God's word with the family here today. And Pastor Jonas, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. It's, you set me up pretty well, and it's kind of hard to come behind you. Let's give Pastor Jonas another hand for that amazing word. As he just broke down the, the miracle uh, in this message, and I've been tasked with just sharing with you what I found out just based on uh, the message in this scripture. Same scripture, I'm just going to read it very quickly. Protocol has already been set. Uh, Daniel chapter 3, and I'm just going to read quickly verses 17 through 18. And the word says, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue that you have set up. I just want to talk briefly for the next 12 minutes from a subtitle of there's levels to this. Amen. There is levels to this. Uh, the phrase there's levels to this was birthed to signify that there are necessary steps to reach a certain height or, of completion or understanding. Uh, in the educational field, it is a remarkable feat to achieve a degree on the doctoral level but to celebrate the doctoral and not appreciate the bachelor's and master's work that was necessary to complete the journey is a disservice to the individual's dedication and sacrifice along the way. Though each level could argue that their importance is greater than the next, what should, what should truly be admired are the lessons gathered at each stage of learning, the ability to retain these lessons, and accurately exercising the knowledge at the appropriate time. Somebody say there's levels to this. So just let me give you a quick couple examples. So if I were to have a conversation with Happy Feet with... So if I were to have a quick conversation with Brother Gene Garrard, Happy Feet, concerning real estate, uh, I believe the first thing that he would say to me is, Dorian, man, there's levels to this. And I don't think he would be arrogant in his response. What he would simply be saying is, there's a bunch of steps. There's some things you're going to have to learn. There's some development that's going to be needed for you to reach the level that I'm at. I've had to go through and learn all about financing. I had to learn about the proper homes to buy, which homes to buy, which not to buy, how to renovate, how not to renovate, how to choose a contractor. There's certain things that he already knows that I do not know. There's just levels to this. If I had a conversation with Pastor David as often as I do uh, about ministry and pastoral leadership and leading a massive church, uh, the first thing that I can hear in his voice with his response is, man, there's levels to this. There's some things that I had to overcome. There's some lessons that I had to learn there's some things I learned in the storefront that prepared me for Alhambra, that prepared me for Noel, that prepared me for the sanctuary that, that, that we're in now. There's Dorian, there's, there's just some levels to this. And again, it wouldn't be arrogant in his response. It's just that there's some things that he already knows that he's already been through, that he's already been prepared for, that I have no way of knowing how to actually deal with those things. There's just simply levels to this, which is so powerful and has so many preaching possibilities, it's very hard to look at Daniel chapter 3 and their deliverance in the fiery furnace. But in order to really appreciate that, you have to appreciate their development along the way. Because their ability to overcome and their ability to have faith in the midst of death didn't just happen right at that very moment, but it happened at the levels along the way. All of their growth, it prepared them for that very moment. Because if you look at Daniel 3, you have to fully understand that they were prepared by faith that, that they needed, excuse me. It prepared the three young men for the faith they needed to fuel that miracle. And all of these things happened through Daniel chapter 1 and chapter 2. And if you know anything about leadership development, there's three ways that leaders usually go about in developing others. There's the I do stage, the we do stage, and then the you do stage. The I do stage is simply learning by observation. 
I'm going to show you and you're going to watch me. Then the second level is the we do stage where there's learning by participation. We're going to do it together. I'll give you guidance just to make sure that you have it. And then the final stage is the you do level where you're actually learning by application. I've showed you, I've done it with you. Now you're on your own. I do, we do, and then you do. Somebody say there's levels to this. So let's look at this. The first level is the I do stage, faith through observation. When you backtrack from Daniel chapter 3, you go back to Daniel chapter 1, you see that they had just been taken captive by King Nebuchadnezzar in the Babylonian Empire. And the king made a decree and said, everybody, we're going to go ahead and we're going to select the best young men and we're going to bring them in and we're going to indoctrinate them into the Babylonian way. And what happens during this time is they were rationed a certain portion of food in a certain way that they had to eat. They were going to bring them into the culture. Well, Daniel had a problem with this because Daniel didn't want to defile his God by taking on the diet and taking on the ways of the Babylonian culture. Because, you see, Daniel wanted to stay true to his God and true to his culture and everything that he had already learned. So the Bible says that Daniel was given favor, and he was given favor with the chief of staff to have a conversation with him to say, look, we really don't want to do this. Will you allow us to stay true to our, our God and true to what we do and eat the food that we want to eat? The chief of staff's response was, man, I don't want to get in trouble, but I trust you because God gave him favor. How many times has God given you favor in the midst of a situation that you really shouldn't have had it? How can you be captive with a whole other army and God gives you favor with the chief of staff to continue with their own culture? So what happens, Daniel is the type of person who God used to model this for the three Hebrew boys. You see, we're still talking about the three Hebrew boys, but anytime God wants to do something on the earth, he does it through people. So God chose Daniel to be the model for the three Hebrew boys on this I do level. See, that first level is I do is faith through observation. They had a front row seat to watch Daniel go ahead and negotiate with the chief of staff in order to get the desired outcome that he wanted. Faith through observation. Daniel did all of the negotiating. Daniel did everything, and Daniel used, was used to model this for the gentleman. So the three Hebrew boys on their first level were just observing. Somebody say, I'm, I'm just observing right now. Faith through observation. That's just level one. But then we see once they graduated from level one, then they moved up to level two, which is the we do stage. Daniel here was modeling them again how to actually go ahead and function while you're held captive and while you're being bound. And it's faith through participation. Here's the second level. It's faith through participation. So what happens on this second level is in chapter two, we've moved on from chapter one. Now we're at chapter two. Daniel's put into the situation where the king has had many dreams and he needs somebody to interpret these dreams. All of the people around him are not able to interpret the dreams. The king gets really upset and says, listen, I need somebody to interpret these dreams to tell me what's going on before I lose my mind. And if you can't help me do this, I'm going to kill everybody. All the Chaldeans, all the people, all the leaders, all of these so-called wise men, you're going to lose your life. So Daniel hears about this because the man comes to kill Daniel and the Hebrew boys because they are one of the wise men. So again, Daniel says, listen, fellas, we got to do something. We got to call on God. So I need you to come with me. We are going to call on God and we are going to ask God together to give us the vision of this dream. So they go into prayer and they begin to pray and begin to petition God for the information for the dream. This is the faith through participation, because you see in chapter one, they watched. But in chapter two, Daniel pulled them along and pulled them in with him to petition God together. So now their faith went from the I saw God do it. Now their faith is I'm going to petition God and ask God for myself to do it. And so what God does is God go ahead and gives them the dream and they give the information and they present it to King Nebuchadnezzar. King Nebuchadnezzar is very happy. He's excited. And he says, praise the God of Daniel, praise the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who's given me all of this information. And then he goes about and he saves everyone's lives. And I'll come back to, to that in a moment because this is the faith through participation phase. And this is the question that I want to ask you. If you're a leader and you're cultivating somebody else, are you, are you, are you, are you cultivating your own faith or are you borrowing someone else's? 
Like, what are you doing on this phase? On this phase, if it's faith through observation, are you learning on your own? Where are you at right now in your walk with God? Are you still in chapter one or have you graduated to chapter two? Are you still waiting on the God that mama used to pray to or are you going to God for yourself? Are you still waiting on the God that the pastor talks about every day or are you getting down on your knees on yourself and building your own relationship with God? This is faith through participation, participating on my own. And this third level here is faith through application. Now we get to the popular part of the scripture that everybody knows about that Pastor Jonah so eloquently just talked about, where they get to the point where they're facing death with the fiery furnace. The three Hebrew boys are in a position now where they've seen God move already, and they already know the culture that they're trying to be indoctrinated in, but they know where their heart truly is. So every time they hear the music, they will not bow down because we're not going to bow down to this false God. We're going to continue to worship the God that we already know. We're going to continue to worship God that has already been a deliverer. We're going to continue to worship the God that has already been a healer. We're not going to bow down to this golden image that you set up, this false God. We're going to worship the God that we truly know. And what happens is the music plays, everybody bows down, but the other wise men who are already part of the Babylonian culture see that the three Hebrew boys decided not to bow down and bring themselves over to that culture. So what do they do? They run and tell the king about what's going on. And this is just a side note of something that I want you to see and something I want you to remember. Watch out for the people who only speak when you fail. Because watch this, if you go back to chapter 2, these are the same people who Daniel and the Hebrew boys just saved their lives because they interpreted the dream. So rather than celebrate them and give them props for what they've done, the minute they see them do something that is perceived to be wrong, they run and tell the king. Watch out for the folks who are loud when you lose, but quiet when you win. Isn't it amazing how after they saved their lives, the first thing they wanted to do was run and tell the king what they wouldn't do because they knew it was crazy and they knew what the king would do to them anyway because they wanted to lift themselves up because Daniel and the Hebrew boys, because of the favor that was on their lives, they made them look bad and look stupid because they could interpret the dream. Watch out for the folks who are loud when you lose, but quiet when you win. Watch out for the folks and when you get the promotion, they don't even like your status, but you my friend. Watch out for the folks when you get elevated and get to the place where you need to be in God and the place where you need to be in your career. They have nothing for you, but the minute you mess up, Boy, they got a post about it, a subliminal post. They want to tell everybody, tick tocking and everything. Watch out for the folks that are loud when you lose, but quiet when you win. I'm just talking about faith through application. So what happens? They go ahead and have this conversation. King Nebuchadnezzar pulls them to the side and say, hey, listen, man, I gave the decree. If you don't do it, I'm going to throw you into the furnace. You're going to die. This is what's going to happen. And what kind of God will save you from my wrath? That was his mistake. Because not only did he put it to, he, he put their God to the test, but he put them to the test. And their response was, if we are thrown in the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us and he will rescue us from your power. They were operating in faith. They had seen somebody operate in faith. They had participated in faith. And now they were applying the faith that they had already been a part of. And watch this. This is another side note. God doesn't show up until when? Their faith is locked in, and the king's faith is locked in. So what faith was that you're talking about? Well, their faith was that God would deliver them. The king's faith was what God would deliver you. And I believe those two locked together made God come down and show up and show out in the way he did and save them in the midst of the fiery furnace. So this is what you have to do. Your faith has been put to another level in 2020. And I'm not a prophet, and I'm not going to sit here and give you a word for 2021. But I believe if you opened your eyes on January 1st, and you made it from January 1st to March, that was a level. If you made it from March to June, that was another level. If you made it from June to September, that was another level. And if you made it from September to now, that is another level. So go ahead and look at 2020 and talk about all the negative that happened. But if you made it from there to here, you've just been elevated to another level. 
and I come to preach to you and tell you this morning, you ought to celebrate God for just making it to another level. Your faith was at a different place in January, but it's heightened in December. You didn't believe God the way you do now, the way you did then. Your faith has been elevated to a whole nother part just because God gave you somebody to model. Here's the message in this miracle, and here's the central idea, the one thing that I want you to take away, is to maximize our development and ensure we are properly equipped for life's purpose. God will sometimes provide layers of training opportunities, and this will be for our benefit, but it will be for his glory. The Hebrew boys were saved. They didn't have to die in a fiery furnace. That was their benefit, but God got the glory. The Hebrew boys didn't have to leave this earth in a way that they didn't want to, that was for their benefit, but it was for God's glory. The way God is developing you now is for your benefit, but it will be for his glory.